Since the middle of July, well before it was brought up in the media, Gulf residents have had concerns about what the dispersants were really doing in their waters. On Thursday, August 5th, the Steps Coalition, as part of their regular quarterly meeting, invited representatives of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to address their gathering and to answer questions about the aftermath of the BP oil spill. While there were many comments made and questions asked and answered over the nearly two-hour meeting, the one that generated the most debate surrounded the use of dispersants. The following video is that portion of the meeting. It is unedited except for the elimination of dead time between comments like when the public address microphone was moved around the room. What is the long-term effect on these fishermen uh, working out there, breathing the environment that they're breathing that was sprayed with corset? What do we know about this person? Okay, at CDC and the Agency for Toxic Substance Disease Registry, they looked at all the constituents, what makes up the dispersant. And for those of you who are just curious, what a dispersant is, is soap. Okay, so if on our website at cdc.gov, they have a fact sheet for workers dealing with dispersants. And it basically says, if you take with the, the raw product and you get it on your skin, it could cause skin irritation. If you get it into your eyes, it can cause burning. If you breathe it in, under, again, this is direct product, it can cause irritation. Well, most of the constituents in the dispersant are food additives. That is why the Food and Drug Administration was not worried about them bioaccumulating inside the fish because they don't bioaccumulate. Second thing about it is it has a half life of 17 days, which means that once they spray it on the water or they released it underwater, 17 days after that, half the product is gone and starts decomposing after that. Now, I had a gentleman ask me, well, if this stuff is so non-toxic, or so, so, so toxic, what's gonna happen if we spray it with the oil? The EPA, under Secretary Jackson's uh, request, went back and tested toxicity of the dispersant and oil and oil to see if it increases the toxicity of the product. And their study came out and basically says it is no more toxic whether it has dispersant in it or it doesn't. And again, the dispersant's breaking up, it's soap. If you were to get it in your eye, like Irish Springs, it would burn, okay? People who were most at risk of being exposed to dispersants were those people handling it, pumping it into the well, or those spraying it on the vessels, okay? Your vessel's opportunity, if they were doing the actual spraying, they may have come in contact with it. The National Occupational Institute, or NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Health and Safety, was requested by EPA, to, or by BP, to go out and do what's called a health risk assessment. And they were out there looking at spraying dispersants, people doing operations on boats, doing the deconning of vessels, and basically looking at what the risks were and how people are being exposed. And if there is a job that's going to expose you to these chemicals at an unhealthy risk, they're basically requiring them to be put into respirators or suits. No one was asked to be put into those because it wasn't at those levels of toxicity. Now, what is EPA doing to check up on these dispersants to make sure how they work in the environment? Well, since they were using that, they've been checking the air and the water trying to find the constituents for the dispersants. And looking at the samples, they have not been able to find them. Why? Because they're breaking up quickly in the environment. That, that is not an accurate statement in any shape or form. The Mobile Press Register has found dispersants in the water. The Gulf Coast Research Lab has found the signature for core exit in larva for crap. So, you know, those kind of statements discredit you when you make those comments that it's nothing more. We're talking very toxic substances that are in the dispersants. It's not soap. And that those kind of comments insult the intelligence of people who have already looked at this uh, and the breakdown of the chemicals that are in there. I, I don't appreciate that at all. You know, do we want to go into the details of what is in these dispersants? I mean, 2-2-butoxyethanol yeah. 
is on the on the sheet for core exit. And I don't know if you're misinformed, but we got you on tape. Right. You need to tell these people the truth. I'm telling you, you need to tell them the truth. I'm what's in, what's in core exit? Tell them right now what's in core exit. I don't know the facts you would be right You don't now. know what's in core exit? I can't list you all have the no business with that mic telling these people. That you don't know. It is on. It is on our what, sir. You can go to our website and pull off those fact sheets. You go to the website. I have to be here telling these people what's going on. And you sir, got two butoxy ethanol. Excuse I'll, me. I'll calm down. The guy, the guys, the guys putting the the core exit in the airplanes are wearing respirators, and they're wearing hazmat suits. If if you get two butoxy, if you get core exit on you, you are dead. If you touch it on your skin, you will die. It affects your central nervous system. The average age of a worker, I'm sorry I'm upset. The average age of a worker at Exxon Valdez is 50 years old. 50% of them are dead. They're asking about your fishermen. They're all gonna be dead at 50 years old. They're breathing that stuff. It is not out of the environment. I'm sorry I'm upset. I know a lot about this. And you're not telling the truth. That you're here as an expert. You shouldn't have that. If you don't know what's in core exit, you're telling these people it's soap. That stuff well, will kill I, you if you were in I'd like to. Sir, that sir, sir I'm, I'm sorry you disagree with my opinion. But basically, I am quoting what is what our toxicologists have basically come up with when they looked at the constituents. And basically, they were looking at each one of them individually. You're not, you're not, you're not accurate. And, and, I'm sorry, but you're not you're not right. So, no, he's right. I'm not telling you. Anybody else know about core exit in here? We all know about no, this all gentleman is coming around. It's a real website. And we all and, know what and, and which we ma'am, the only website that I can quote is the one that's with cdc.gov. And they have it under the they have it they have it at and it's linked from the the EPA's website does link to ours. And, well, are the toxicity tests done on shrimp and whatever the leather little creature is? And if 50% of them die within a certain amount of time, then it's toxic. If they don't die all of a sudden, then it's not toxic. Is that true? Even when these products are considered for application, they have to undergo a series of toxicity tests. And it's, the toxicity tests are designed to um, use sensitive species and expose them to certain ranges of concentrations to something like a dispersant, in this case, the Corexit compound, and then to evaluate the impact or degree of toxicity to the, to the species over, an ex, over you know, 96 hours is one, one time frame that they use. Um, so did that? Uh, so if it's, we're looking, you're, that's only 96 hours or whatever day that is. We have been dealing with this for three months now. There are fishermen that are sick. The people on the coast here that have smelled this stuff have gotten ill or have headaches or have respiratory problems. And when you come in and tell us, don't worry, be happy, nothing's wrong with you, that's why we all get upset because there is something wrong with our people and we are dealing with this and we've been begging the government to stop the dispersants and it never happened. And we're hearing reports now that this stuff is being sprayed off of boats in the middle of the night when no one's looking to, to hide the oil that's still existing. Uh, I can't prove that now, but there are enough fishermen out there that have said they've seen this and they're concerned about it. They work for BP, they've got contracts, they won't talk publicly. And if that's being done, there are studies that say don't put this stuff near shore in shallow waters. It's, it's dangerous. And we can't be anything but upset because we're going to be here and y'all are going to be gone and we have to live this, with this forever and ever and ever. And 96 hours isn't enough. Okay. Well, they've, already, they've already sunk all the oil with this person. They're not, they're not spraying any more dispersant. They've already sunk the oil. They've already used enough to sink it. That's what it is. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we're we're here to hear from these officials, please, sir. It's to sink 45% of the oil in 30 I minutes. I understand. Okay, so sir, let's, sir. Let's, let's, uh, Seriously, do not interrupt these people who have come from the government to speak to these citizens. Please, sir. We want these citizens to hear. We're going to listen to the answers. Please do not interrupt. Okay, uh, a couple things. Um, dispersants use has only been approved, whether it's been in offshore areas in near Mississippi. In fact, the only area where it's ever been applied on this incident is in the Louisiana jurisdiction. This oil well where it was uh, located is in the, the 
Louisiana jurisdiction about 60 miles offshore. It's never been, it's never been approved for use in this, in this region. And to my knowledge, in this region, off the coast of Mississippi, it has not been approved for use on this incident. And there's been no information to suggest that it's been approved by the BP Coast Guard and or EPA for application in this area. So that, that's one thing. Second thing, as far as the information that I have available to me working in incident command, there's been no dispersant applied after two days after the well was capped. There was a couple hundred gallons applied to a fresh uh, oil that was dispersible and some a lot of oil not any anything beyond being fresh and weathered is not dispersible is not approved for use under those conditions so I, I just wanted I just wanted to mention those two things I'm not I'm, I'm sure a lot of information gets passed around but I'm going to just tell you what what we're familiar with and what we would otherwise a, approve and the and the last thing I would say is you know EPA and the Coast Guard realized that we were, we were, we're all in uncharted waters on the use of dispersant on this incident. Let's, let's be honest about it. It's never, it was contemplated for use on an oil spill to keep the oil from coming on shore. What, what, do, you, what do you try to protect against? In this incident, there was no way because of the volume of it and the degree of the lack of control on the well that it was ever, you were ever gonna stop it from coming on shore. Coming on shore causes a lot of problems cause great problems to the environment and natural resources. So the decision was made to, to apply dispersants. This has been, you know, a proof in concept for oil spills for a long time. Now, when I say we're in uncharted waters, we, we all know that this was the one incident that we never had experience with before. And, and when you asked about, are there areas where we have questions? This is certainly one of those areas we have questions. We have a lot to learn about this. But we can say for the sampling that we've conducted, we've conducted water sampling and air sampling in relation to this incident on shore in Mississippi, and we've not found evidence of any of the markers of the Corexit to date in any of the samples that we've collected. Now, I know there's been reports that others have. Uh, you mentioned I'm not familiar with the report with uh, shellfish, and, and we don't regulate that, so I can't, I can't really speak to that. When you talk about the Louisiana jurisdiction or the Alabama, there's only one Gulf of Mexico. And what happens in Louisiana comes to Mississippi because it's all one water. And that's one of the things that concerns me. Oh, it, it didn't happen in Mississippi, as if a state line means anything to the Gulf of Mexico. And I think it, people around here understand the waters because we live on them. So there's got to be a better description of what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico, it's not about it's in a state or it's not in a state. It's every one of these states are on the Gulf of Mexico, which is affected. This was just one of potentially hundreds of public meetings that have occurred since the BP oil well exploded back in April. And the uncertainty surrounding the effects of the oil and all the cleanup efforts will likely continue for some time to come. From the fishermen like Kenny De Niro to the scientists like the Audubon Society's Mark LaSalle, there still appear to be more questions than answers. The answers, as they are discovered, will shape the future of the Gulf Coast, its wildlife, its inhabitants, and the humans who live and work here.